Have you built systems on top of Microsoft Azure's data and analytics services? Are you wondering what Microsoft Fabric means for your existing investments and skills? I recently spoke to someone who is uniquely well placed to talk about these things. In fact, he had so much to say about Fabric that we split this recording into three parts. If you want to hear the other two, please make sure that you subscribed to this channel. So with me today, I have Tom Peplow, who is a principal at Milliman, and we also have Engine's very own Ed Freeman, who is a senior data engineer. Now, I'm really excited to be able to talk to Tom today about Fabric because Milliman have been pioneers in the world of high performance cloud based computation and analytics. They've been building systems in this way since 2010, so they know a great deal about how to do this. So, Tom, don't you already have everything you need? Does Fabric bring anything to, to the party for you? Yeah, um, we do have a lot, right? And um, we've built a lot over a long time. Uh, but we that's one of the challenges I think that we have is, you know, our differentiated value in the market is actuarial computations. Um, we want to make it easy for actuaries to do, um, to do their job. And that means that we need to give them breadth of tools to do you know, all the things that are important to actuaries. And a big part of that is data analytics. Um, they run models to project um, how insurance companies are going to perform out into the future, which generates huge amounts of data for them, huge amounts of valuable insight they can use to better plan for the future, design better products, and, and help keep people safe. Um, and it's been pretty difficult, really, to kind of handle that much data um, and give them tools to report on it well. Um, it's required us to, to build and glue together lots of capabilities from Azure, and we've evolved it. You know, when we started, we used Hadoop. Now we use um, Spark. Uh, so that was a transition. Um, our analytics uses Power BI Embedded, which is fantastic. Um, and we embed ETL capabilities from Data Factory too, so they can self-serve um, these things. But um, you know, we've put together a lot of capabilities ourselves, um, and we have to look after that. And I think where Fabric's helpful um, is it could be disruptive to our strategy of how we glue together all these things. Um, I mean, if 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 this were a thing ten years ago, we would have used it. Uh, it's now a thing. We have to decide if we're going to use it. Um, so we're in the process of evaluating whether it solves the problems better than we've solved them. Um, there's obviously other other players in the mix too. There's other vendors who have similar solutions, but um, we're very much uh, looking at Fabric as a mechanism for us to deliver more value to our customers without having to write as much code uh, for the long run. And I assume, Tom, it's uh, it's weighing up the cost of kind of upskilling on a on kind of a new um, Microsoft data platform versus the benefits that you might get from this kind of a new satisfaction and, and self-service um, flavor of a, of a Microsoft data platform. I suppose when you've done uh, kind of platform migrations in the past, how, how, um, how easy has it been for the, uh, the actuaries to actually get, get used to a new platform? Um, so one of the interesting things we've tried to do is to try and shield the customer from as much change as possible. Um, like, for example, Data Factory V1 to Data Factory to V2 was kind of a transparent thing. I didn't notice. Uh, we could run, we ran both side by side so that we could evaluate when V2 was performing as we'd like at the scale which we pushed it. Um, so we have, you know, engineering ways that we can, we can do that safely. Where it becomes difficult is when the user experience is the thing that changes, right? Because they've got to click the buttons and the screens to do the things they want to do. Uh, so in every time we've, when we move from Hadoop to um, Azure Data Factory, for example, um, we use mapping data flows instead of pig. Um, you know, that was a very visible change to the users because they went from writing pig in, in Hadoop to building um, uh, data flow code in, in, in ADF. Uh, so we, you know, they could choose when they wanted to do it and we kind of left the, both capabilities exist in our platform still today, and you know you can choose which you use. Um, over time, it was evident that the newer technology that we brought to bear was was worth using, and customers just use more of it. So um, 
we, we try and provide options to keep people feeling comfortable that they can do their job today whilst providing them better options to do their job in the future. Yeah, and I think one of the benefits with, with Microsoft Fabric, especially from an <clears throat> end user perspective, is it is kind of the foundational blocks are built on the, the Power BI service and the, the Power BI UI. So there is there should be kind of a level of familiarity that, that existing Power BI users will have with that. That being said, it's still new new types of artifacts laid out in a slightly different way. There's always going to be some sort of a kind of upskilling exercise, I think. Yeah, they've done quite a quite a nice job of trying to keep it similar and the user experience across the new things that have come in, like notebooks, the way it integrates, the way it kind of plays with the other components they've thought about the integration, which I think is actually really important because it's that handoff between needing to do data transformation to looking at information. You don't want to have to jump through lots of different technologies, right? We, we tried to make that easy for our users ourselves. It was very easy to you know, do some transformation and look at the results, but you know, having that really stuck together by the vendor is is critical because it just the things you need to do to be efficient and lower that in a loop development cycle time. So you're going from doing your work to checking your work to automating your work. Um, making that real tight is where you get value because people struggle to retain context. You know, we know as developers, if our unit tests are slow, it stresses us out, right? So. We want that same experience for our customers. We want them to be able to build models, analyze the results from models as tightly as possible, which requires us to run on large computations at scale to generate huge amounts of data for them to look at and then just making that really fast and really seamless. Right. We're going to have to stick our data and calculations in a platform to make that happen because no one else has our IP. But um, what we want to do is when they're in that platform, that everything is really seamlessly integrated so that they're doing the job as quickly and as easily as they possibly can. So do you think that Fabric is mainly going to just reduce your engineering and operational costs because it does more of the things that you used to have to do yourself? Or do you think there's actually any fundamentally enabling features in it that you couldn't, in principle, build for yourself? Yeah, one lake's huge. And one of the biggest challenges we have is how do we federate our information with our customers, both directions. You know, it, that what we get given to us is... Um, every insurance policy holder they've got across all the blocks of business they've ever issued, every asset they've invested in um, with every asset provider they've got, um, economic scenario data, Bloomberg feeds, all these types of data come from all these types of places from all these different types of vendors. And it's hard to do that. You know what it's like when you do these big data integration projects and we've got customers with hundreds of separate feeds of information coming through to us. Um, we then obviously take that and run actuarial models to produce really valuable insight to the business. It's a big old data set. We have to heavily aggregate it before we can give it back to them. So being able to have this federated environment where all of our data sits together and can be queried together with super low latency. I mean, the, 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 what we could be able to do with a technology like One Lake is, is really compelling because the way I think of this is like cloud vendors can do this, but providers who sit on top of a cloud couldn't. So my bits and bytes are stored on the physical hard disk in Azure, um, which and, and Ed's bits and bytes are also stored kind of in the same place, where right? they're all muddled up. So when, when I query my data, it's not really any different to, to me querying Ed's data. It's just that I don't have permission to get to Ed's data. Uh, that means that they have the, optim the op opportunity to optimize queries in ways that others couldn't because they own the security right close to the data. Do you think the um, the standardization on this open table format in, in Delta Lake, is that is that something you or even kind of your actuaries care about or um, will, will that actually enable you to do anything different with kind of cross cloud or um, using existing, say, Databricks workspaces to read and, and write that to those tables? Do you see any benefit in that? I think the openness is key. Um, like I described earlier, people's transitions are going to be incremental. Um, it remains to be seen if Fabric's going to win or be adopted, right? So being able to make a bet that will work if technology changes on us is huge. So be, not being locked into a particular technology because of open standards is very important. I also think that, you know, the internet's probably the most successful information system that exists and it has no, in, it has no challenge of sharing information, right? It's, you can click one link and land on a different page. And that was the beauty of the idea, right, is it was completely standards-based, Nobody owned that technology. It's owned by the community, and you can you can improve it together. 
So if we start thinking about the challenges inside of organizations, federating data across departments is hard. Federating data across businesses is hard. There's technology and standards that have done it at super big scale. Um, so I really think that standards are a big enabler for this to start to happen much more smoothly within organizations. So one of the things that seems to change with Fabric compared to uh, Synapse, for example, and you've touched on this a little bit, is it seems to be much more end user focused. It, it feels like it's sort of more of an office suite thing than a kind of developer oriented tool. Um, are there, do you see both pros and cons of that shift more to that end? Um, I do. It's interesting because, um, you know, my job has me out on the road seeing our customers. And um, one of the things I've been doing is asking our customers what they think of this. Now it's public, right? And we were able to bring some of our customers in on the private preview uh, when it was known as Trident 2. So we've been able to have some some dialogue with them. I think there's a huge amount of excitement on the business side. Um, I think there's a, I can't find this presentation. I wish I could find it, but I saw Amy Hood talk once about the finance transformation inside of Microsoft's accounting department. And that's what we do. We do actuarial transformations very similar to what Amy would have had to have done with Microsoft's finance team. And a key thing that she said was that the accountants could do a lot themselves without needing to rely on IT, which freed IT up to do a huge amount of other valuable things for the business, not having to worry about how to build a balance sheet for an accountant. Actuaries are like accountants on steroids. The types of things they want to do with data is not, is not um, easily explained to people in IT, right? So they're very excited because it's like, oh, I get more data, I get to do more things with that data. I can do my job more easily. So that's good. And that was a big enabler for Microsoft's accounting transformation. Um, on the other side, though, you've got, you've got fear. You know, everybody remembers access databases, right? So I've literally heard from a customer, it's like, this is just going to be like access all over again, right? Um, and, you know, and the other thing is around the FinOps. How much are these people going to spend doing this type of analytics? You know, are they going to be... Are they going to be strict to making sure there's a good ROI and all the st stuff they do? Because what you can do with this is, you know, you ultimately can spend a lot of money. Um, so I think there's apprehension in um, the IT side. Uh, there's also apprehension because they're in a similar position to I'm in. It's like we have an existing platform that works that we need to decide what to do with. Do we continue to invest or do we look to disrupt it? Um, and I think my dilemma is the same as everyone else's dilemma because lots. Of, it's not like it was like Cloud 101 when we were back in 2010 when no one was in the cloud and we were bringing them there. Um, now it's like we're there and we've got platforms they like and work. And now this is a particularly disruptive change to that because Microsoft have glued all the bits together for you so you don't have to glue them together yourself. But then what do you do, all the, what do, you do with all the glue you build? Um, so I, I hear both sides. Businesses kind of like it and the uh, me and... Uh, the IT side are kind of trying to figure out what to do with it. I, was, I suppose that from from that perspective, from IT uh, kind of in a in a tug of war with with the actual users, uh, how how kind of difficult is it in a in a large enterprise like like yours to put in those guardrails to make sure that the things don't turn into a, a mess and and kind of the actuaries don't start churning loads of money and they don't start creating loads of artifacts that um, they end up abandoning is it's it's a non-trivial exercise right to try and put those guardrails in place keeping kind of it and the government governance team happy um with with how people are using the platform yeah so we we think of our we we, we are trying to bring uh, like a software engineering approach to actuarial science right and if you think about what software engineers do is they have a development environment where they build and test their software. And then when they're done, they put it into a production environment. So that simple separation of duties between I'm doing my work and I'm building my things to I'm running my things and looking at the numbers does introduce some rigor because you can put DevOps and FinOps around the process of being in production. So I built a model. I want to put it in production. You can ask them the question, how much does it cost to run? Do you have reports around it? What's the impact of the change you just made? And you can control the changes from one place to the other. And then you increase, and then you don't frustrate them because you have a robust um, CI/CD process for promoting changes from development into production. So what you get is a not frustrated user. They, they're not like there's not a whole load of governance stopping them getting their job done, but you don't get a frustrated IT uh, team because you're not putting um, not very good stuff into production that's very expensive to run. 
On the other side, though, sometimes you've got to answer questions quickly because your boss comes to you and says, what's the impact of this thing that's just happened yesterday, right? We do some really clever stuff with machine learning to train models so they can, you know, evaluate market conditions now based on not having to run these big, heavy models. That's really powerful. But the other thing is, like, sometimes you've just got to run a model. Sometimes you've just got to change some assumptions. Sometimes you've got to go spend some money. Uh, when it's aligned to value, if the CFO of a large insurance company is asking you to do something quick, they're not really going to care how much it costs if they get the answer on time. So, um, yeah. and then it's just creating the accountability back to track all that through, right? So being robust and mature about it is not a technology problem, it's a process problem. And, and I suppose Fabric does seem to have kind of taken that on board, whereas kind of Power BI in the early days didn't really, it didn't really think about kind of the CICD, the DevOps and kind of the FinOps behind Power BI so much. That all came much more recently, but Fabric seems to be from the outset bringing in the principles like version control and kind of Git integration in, at the, in the kind of the fabric portal la layer. Um, and soon to come will be a, a, a swathe of APIs to, to drive all of these things. So I suppose from your perspective, you want that rigor, that, that, that surely is um, a very good thing. Definitely using Git's huge. Uh, two reasons. One, um, it's about to do a lot of work to decompose the Power BI artifacts so they can be version controlled. It's really helpful. Second is it's standards-based, it's Git, so you can integrate with it easily, which is huge. So then we've got mechanisms for putting our modeling technology alongside technology that we don't own the IP of. So um, they are listening. This is one of the things that with Fabric, it, it, they've, they've done, they've taken some time to get there because it was a big investment. But all the things that the community were asking for are in Fabric, you know, better controls, better governance, better automation, um, more openness, um, version control, all those things are just out of the box. There are lots of things that we had to build. That we, we do version control Power BI artifacts in our platform because it's important for us. When the regulator comes to us and asks, why are these numbers these numbers? We have to be able to answer that question. And at the time, Microsoft didn't give us a mechanism for version controlling Power BI. So we essentially version controlled it as a black box, which isn't a particularly elegant solution because we can't show you what changed. So things are getting better. Um, and they're obvious places that we can reinvest in modernizing so that they get a better experience around what we've already got. In the next part, Tom will talk about the relationship between Microsoft Fabric and AI. If you enjoyed this first part, please click the like button. And if you want to make sure that you catch the next part, please subscribe to this channel.